What does it mean, the house of God? That's a really important question, and a lot of religious people get involved in that, but it's not about religion. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hemmer. And I'm Janice. The name of this program is Quick Study Television. We take you through the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 every single year. And we're very excited about this. Psalm 120 to 125, that's what we're going to study today. Corey helps us to do that. Corey, what's up? I'm taking a look at the Psalms of Ascent and ancient pilgrimages to Jerusalem. Excellent. Very good. And what did you study, Janice? Well, we have read in Psalm 122 that we need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So at the end of our program, that's exactly what we're going to do. Excellent. And Ryan is here. Ryan, what did you do? Today, I'm looking at the life of the man who many believe to be the human author of Revelation, John the Apostle. All right, John the Apostle, very good. Uh, this is gonna be an interesting day, beloved. So stay there, get your Bible guide, let's study. reading today covers the Psalms of Ascent. Now, these Psalms of Ascent are from Psalm 120 to, through to 134. So there are 15 Ascension Psalms or songs altogether. So today, you and I are going to be focusing in not only on these Psalms, but also an archeological find that relates to pilgrimages to Jerusalem in the ancient world. Psalms 120 to 134 make up what are known as the Psalms of Ascent. These 15 Psalms came to historically be sung by Jewish pilgrims as they made their way to Jerusalem three times a year for the biblically prescribed festivals. Since the city of Jerusalem sits on a high ridge and the temple itself was built on the highest point of that ridge, and the pilgrims' journey was one with a holy purpose, the journey is described as an ascending one physically and spiritually traveling up. Tradition also claims that these psalms came to be recited by the Jewish priests as they ascended the stairs that led to the temple. Recently, archaeologists Yotam and Yigal Tepper have proposed that these pilgrims traveled to Jerusalem on specially made stone roads. While surveying an ancient Roman road in the Bet Horon Pass, they took notice of another stepped road beside it. Both roads were headed to Jerusalem. The Roman Imperial Road was typical, wide, paved to be flat, and with serpentine-like inclines and declines as the topography demanded. This winding pattern meant steps were never necessary, a key function of Imperial Roads as it enabled quick and fuss-free travel with carts. The other road was only half as wide and was composed of steps cut right out of the rock. Interestingly, steps were cut whether or not the topography needed them. Whether steep or moderate, the steps seemed to continue on. These factors led the Teppers to theorize that this road should be identified with what the first century historian Josephus calls the public road or the road that bears people. This stepped road at the Bethoron Pass seems to be a part of a larger network of carved stepped roads throughout Judea. The Teppers have noted that these roads steer away from ancient settlements and close to water sources, a hint, they think, to their Jewish origins, as pilgrims would want to avoid becoming ceremonially unclean and have access to water for ceremonial cleansing. Perhaps these roads provided more than a path to Jerusalem. Perhaps they provided a ceremonially pure way to pilgrimage to the temple. So more research is needed to prove that these ancient roads were, were not built by the Romans. Uh, more research is definitely needed. However, a very good case has been made for this being the case, that these are ancient Jewish pilgrimage roads to Jerusalem. So I, I thought that this was just a fun study to interject into the study of Psalms because it's a very long book and as we're going through it, it can be a little bit dry from uh, the point of view of an archaeologists looking in on these. Because uh, remember, the Psalms were all written, um, most of them were written, I shouldn't say they were all written, but most of them were written during the time period of the kings of Israel and Judah. So it is a very confined time period. Now, there were some Psalms that were written beforehand, for example, the Psalm of Moses that we find in there. And definitely worship was being written before the book of Psalms, before the time of King David kind of inaugurated this tradition. As we see music, in the Bible,
Bible, the time period of Judges, we see some music being recorded in Genesis. Uh, and then, of course, the tradition of music making and music writing continued uh, up until today, all the way through the ancient times. And there are uh, ancient hymnal books, kind of. What we would, you know, a, a modern comparison would be a hymnal book uh, that we find, for example, with the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the tradition of psalm writing continued up until today. However, the biblical time period was one that was closed. So once that book was finished, uh, the biblical psalms ended. You know, going to the house of God sounds very religious, but wait a minute. God's house seems like a place where he would live. This is not religious, but it's right. We should all desire to go to the house of the Lord when we begin to think beyond our ideas and take on the thinking that God desires. We understand that the Lord is not concerned about our being religious, but about our being real. Sin makes us think incorrectly about the God of the universe. When we realize that our Lord is the God of everything, our hope soars. He helps us. He is not interested in us being religious about people or about gods, but that we live correctly and we live righteously. Jesus Christ experienced the most conflict with those considered the religious of his day. God is not religious. Religion is man-made. God is about true life and living. Now that is why he came, to give us the choice to live rightly when we accept him. Psalm 122, verses 1 through 9. I was glad when they said to me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together, where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to the testimony of Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. For thrones are set there for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brethren and your companions, I will now say, peace be within you. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Psalm 122 verses 1 through 9. You know, it is amazing when you begin to understand the Psalms. These are 150 chapters which are designed for music. All of us are musicians, doesn't matter whether you're somebody who doesn't sing or doesn't play an instrument, you listen to music. Everybody is a musician, and especially when you say yes to Jesus Christ, you repent and let him come into your life, then you become somebody who is a musician. God says, sing to the Lord a new song. And that's very important for us to understand today as we look at 122. We'll learn that. Now, if you have your Bible guide, turn to today's passage because this is great. As we focus on this, you will see that we have an introduction paragraph. We have the three points we're going to present right here. And then, of course, there are two things at the bottom on this page that are not included on the television program simply because we just don't have the time for it. But this is really a good way for you to go through the Bible. And I want to promote this. I want to remind people that you can go through the Bible and you can start at any time. And so what you want to do is you want to write to us with the address coming up at the bottom of the screen. Do me a favor and send an offering in any amount. That'll help us. And pray about it. Ask what the Lord would have you do and do that. That would be great, especially right now. Today, listen to how this starts. Very interesting. 
I was glad when they said to me, said what? Let us go to the house because of the Lord. Now, this is, this is really interesting. These songs are meaningful. So in our ways of truth, we focus on this and we say, listen carefully. The house of God. We've talked about the house of God early on, but what is this, the house of God? And I know a lot of people and, uh, you know, different uh, people are, well, I can't invite anybody into my house. It's a mess, you know, and, but the house of God is not designed to impress people. But the house of God is designed to harbor the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to remember that. And as we do, we're going to study Psalm 120 to 125. We're going to look at 122 verses 1 through 9. And Father, in Jesus' name, I pray today that you would help us. Help us to study. Help us to hear you, God. And what you're saying to us through this amazing passage that your Holy Spirit has written. Let us hear what the Holy Spirit wants us to hear in the name of Jesus Christ. And we said together, amen. We go to the first verse. It says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together, very close, where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to the testimony of Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. Very interesting. For thrones are set up there for judgment. The thrones of the house of David. Isn't this something? God desires that we live well and right. Jerusalem is the great city from where God will rule upon his return. You know, Psalm 122 says, whatever you do, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We'll get to it. And it's important for us to understand that Jerusalem is that place. It says it's a compact city. It's tightly, you know, configured so that God designed it that way. And this is very interesting now because we see the, uh, the, the, the backlash of all of the movement to Israel and all of that. Very interesting because God is changing the way we think. You know, you move from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. That's amazing. All right. Now with that in mind, we go to Psalm 122 verse 6 says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. This is a commandment, beloved. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That is a commandment. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces for the sake of my brethren and companions, I will now say, peace be within you. Isn't that something? What a fascinating, you know, we must pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Now, this is important for you to understand. I am a person who takes the Bible literally. I believe that God communicates the word of God and does not expect us to say, well, that's an allegory, that's an allegory, that's an allegory, that's an allegory, that's not real, that's not real, because where do you stop saying that's not real? Many people stop saying that's not real when they can believe it. They base it on their own faith. But the Bible isn't that way. The Bible is God's word to us. The Holy Spirit wrote the word of God. He speaks to us and tells us. And he expands our faith through the word of God. So we need to understand that we must pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That's what he said. Very important. We go back to the next scripture, which is the ninth verse. Listen carefully. Because of the house of the Lord, our God, I will seek your good. I will seek your good. Now, listen carefully. The house of God is a good place because God is there. You see, we have to understand this. When we realize that goodness is not something that man creates. Man doesn't create goodness. Goodness comes when Jesus Christ, God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, we say, Lord, we want you to come into our life and be Lord, and we're going to turn against our sin. 
and we're going to repent. We're going to tell you what's wrong. We are wrong, Lord. Make us right. We're going to change our direction. You need to help us, Lord, because we cannot do it without you. When we do that, then suddenly the Lord comes into our life, expands our heart, changes the way we are, and we can make sense and we start to make things good through the power of Jesus Christ, through his strength, not through our strength. You know, we're not great. You know, Americans or Canadians or British people or South Africans, whatever you want to say, Australians, New Zealanders, doesn't matter. We're not great. God is great. God comes into our heart and makes us able to fulfill his destiny, which is great. So you need to understand that in this world, when we talk, in this world, when we speak, in this world, whatever we do, if it's not empowered by the Holy Spirit, then we need to pray. We need to ask God to take over our life. Father, in Jesus' name, take over my life. Help me to respond, to act and react like a good believer in Jesus Christ. Psalms 126 to 134, next time on Quick Study Television, when we examine victory over sin. Now, this is going to be a unique study, so I want to encourage you to join us next time, and we'll study that. Very good. Ryan? Well, you know, yesterday we studied the life of John the Baptist, and today we study the life of another John, John the Apostle. He was the beloved disciple of Jesus, and many believe him to be the one who received the heavenly visions and penned the book of Revelation. So let's study. John, though just a simple fisherman from Galilee, was about to become one of the 12 disciples and future apostles of Jesus Christ. He, along with his brother James and their father Zebedee, as well as Peter and Andrew, were busy with their fishing business when Jesus called these four young men into service. Not only was John to become one of the 12 apostles, but he, along with Peter and James, were a part of Christ's inner circle of disciples. In fact, Peter, James, and John were Jesus' best friends and witnessed events that the other disciples did not, such as the raising of Jairus' daughter, the transfiguration when Jesus met with Elijah and Moses, and Jesus' private prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it was John and Peter who were entrusted with preparing the Last Supper. Even after Jesus returned to heaven, these three continued in the ministry and became what Paul the Apostle described as pillars of the church. Jesus nicknamed James and John the Sons of Thunder, possibly referring to their overly bold and impulsive style. Indeed, as Bible commentator Stephen Miller observes, when the Samaritans refused to welcome Jesus and his entourage into their city, the brothers sounded a bit like they had a hotline to lightning. Should we order down fire from heaven to burn them up, they asked? Another time, John ordered a man exercising demons in Jesus' name to stop because he was not one of the 12 disciples. The boldest request they made, however, was to sit beside Jesus on his throne. Jesus, of course, denied all of these requests. However, it is notable that the only other person to receive a new name from Jesus is Simon, who he gives the name Peter. This means that the three inner circle disciples all received new names. Yet according to tradition, John was not just one of the inner circle disciples, but was the beloved disciple of Christ, the one whom Jesus loved. Indeed, it was to this man, rather than to his own brothers, that Jesus entrusted his mother Mary. Interestingly, both John and the Old Testament prophet Daniel are called beloved of God, and significantly, both also are the two greatest sources of prophetic revelation in the Bible. 
Indeed, traditionally it is believed that John the Apostle penned Revelation, as well as the Gospel of John, and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John also. And according to the early church, all the other disciples but John died a martyr's death, John's brother James being the first. As for John, he apparently left Jerusalem around AD 65 for Ephesus, where he wrote the fourth gospel and the three epistles. Later, he was exiled to the island of Patmos, where he received dramatic visions from the Lord and penned the book of Revelation, which is titled in the oldest of manuscripts as the Apocalypse of John. After this, John apparently lived in Ephesus and died peacefully at a ripe old age. Like all of us, John was a human and therefore had his downfalls, but ultimately he was loyal and was one of Jesus Christ's best friends and would be later described by Paul the Apostle as one of the pillars of the church. That's in Galatians 2.9, by the way. Now, something else I've said before but bears repeating is that both John and the Old Testament prophet Daniel were called greatly beloved of God. It's interesting then that these two are also the two greatest sources of prophetic revelation in the Bible. As one Bible teacher rightly puts it, because of their faithfulness and obedience, God disclosed revelation to them, not given to any others. Amazing. You know, it is amazing. And, and when you think it through, when you begin to understand it, I, of course, went to Patmos in 91, and we uh, did a series there called Day and Today with my, uh, my friends, Jim Cannell and Nassar Shaheen. Mm -hmm. And we studied the book of Revelation, and it was really interesting to do that. We were there alone with our group. And, uh, I, you know, it, it really is fascinating to compare John with Daniel because Daniel also had a dramatic revelation of God. And uh, John is the only one of Jesus' disciples who saw Jesus Christ before he was crucified, who saw Jesus Christ after he was cruci crucified, saw Jesus Christ ascend to heaven, and saw Jesus Christ in revelation. Mm -hmm. He's the only one. And you begin to understand, and, and they say that uh, he passed away in Ephesus. He was the bishop there. Mm -hmm. And the tr church tradition says he passed away in Ephesus. They had to carry him in the church, and he would say, little children love each other. Little children love each other because he knew the difficulty would be between the church people. And that is fascinating. Really interesting, Ryan. And all, also, you talked about in the Psalms of Ascent. Mm -hmm. You know, we, whenever we see games, you know, like uh, hockey games or whatever, everybody sings the national anthem. <laughs> it's a very true, <laughs> yes. Know, and the national anthem, God bless America, whatever. Uh, oh, Canada, and you know, whatever. But the Psalms of Ascent were psalms that were sang by Israelites. Mm hmm on behalf of their nation, and they, they were sung to God. Yeah, yep. And when you see in the, and you begin to read in the Psalms, and you see Psalms of Ascent mm -hmm. as the title of it, that's what you should recognize. This is a, a song in allegiance to God. Yeah, yep. And so we need to recognize that's the most important song ever. <laughs> Very true. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I just, I thought that was interesting. It is. It and is uh, interesting. by the way, uh, just so you know, uh, we, there's some uh, elections going on today. We have uh, an election happening today in Canada. In Canada. Ontario. Ontario. Ontario, rather. Specifically and, uh, our province. That's yeah. right. <laughs> province of uh, Ontario. And uh, it's about one third of Canada. And uh, we need to pray that God puts the people in power and in place that he has chosen. Mm. And the Christian or the believer uh, needs to read in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, be subject for the Lord's sake. Mm -hmm. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent to pun to, by him to punish those who do evil, and to praise those who do good. And so this is the recognition, Romans 13 also says that, that this is the recognition that God puts in our place. So even in democratic uh, states and democratic yeah. places, we need as believers in Jesus Christ to recognize that. Yeah, so we need to respect the authority that's there, the human authority. However, that doesn't mean that we can't have godly dissonance when it comes to issues. Absolutely. So we, we don't, we don't uh, violate our, our morality or God's morality and his law, uh, but as much as it's possible with us, we try to live in peace and... Well put. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> but you said it better. 
Perfect. <laughs> well put. And, and so, you know, we pray, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray for Ontario. We pray that you would put the people in place that you have ordained for this time. We accept that, and we ask, Lord, that you would help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You also have a very interesting thing. Well, um, Psalm 122 encourages us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Uh, and it, it is very important to any believer, any Gentile believer. A Gentile is somebody who's not Jewish. And so that would be, that would be our family. Mm -hmm. And we have been grafted in because of God's wonderful grace. And we need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem because they are our brothers and our sisters. And we are told in Psalm 122, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brethren and companions, I will now say peace be within you. And so I, I really felt that, you know, you taught on it today. We talk about it often, but I think in these last few minutes, of the program of Quick Study. If you viewers would join with us together, I think Rod, if you would lead us um, in, in a prayer for the peace of Jerusalem. I would love to. I just want to make sure that we understand what we say when we mean grafted in. It says, it says here that there is now no more Jew, no more Gentile because of the new covenant. Right. Mm -hmm. And there is no more slave nor free, male nor female, that we are all grafted in. This is also in Revelation, or in uh, Romans, uh, rather, and it's also in other places of the Bible. The peace of Jerusalem, as you have said, and as you have claimed, is a commandment of God. We need to pray. That's a commandment of God. God commands that we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So we're going to fulfill that today. We're going to ask the Lord to do that, however he decides to do it. Mm -hmm. But we pray that God will do that. Father, in Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Now, we, we understand what that means. We get it. We, we understand that the city is, is not divided, that it's a city that Jerusalem technically uh, owns. But at the same time, we understand that in many people's mind, it is divided. So we understand when we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, what we're praying for. But we also know, God, that you are above all things and all people. So, Lord, when we pray, we are addressing God Almighty. And we say, Lord, bring peace to this city. Bring your presence to this city, your home, to Zion. I thank you, Lord, for everything that you have done through this city. I thank you for the, the new Jerusalem that will descend and implant itself there. We thank you, Lord, for the millennium and all the things you'll do there. But, Father, we ask right now in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Father, we ask that you would bring supernatural peace to Jerusalem so people would begin to understand the truth about who you are and about what you did and why. In Jesus' name, amen. Very important that we do that. Remember, God gives commandments in Psalms. One of the commandments is pray every day for the peace of Jerusalem.